is the um, introduction to SCCA, the title screen. And what I would like to uh, ask you to do, if I manage to move from one um, thing to the next, I think should be here, is to look with me at a number of uh, images that show places and people. And uh, these places and people have something in common. And I would like to invite you to think about what could it be that they have in common. So um, they, they are from very many different uh, countries, as you might see, and ecosystems. And uh, in fact, um, they also may be familiar to some of you but not to all. Just think it through, as you can see, some are arid lands, some are very much wetlands. What do they have in common? What kind of feelings they evocate in you? And if you do recognize something that they have, what would that be? Here we are in Iran, for instance, and here in Zambia and here in Japan, Madagascar. Anybody who wants to say what, uh, or, or to guess what they have in common, the chat, you could write it down. China, here we are in uh, Kenya, Australia, Morocco, and again, Iran and UK, and this is uh, Congo Brazzaville, and we are in the heart of the Amazons in Colombia, and here is uh, close to the Alps where we, where I am actually close by. So what all these places and people have in common? And the answer is they are all about ICCAs. And um, what is ICCA is for? What does it stand for? It's not, first of all, an acronym. Uh, an acronym would be the initials of some words that it stands for. It's an abbreviation because it had a long uh, development as a, as a set of uh, um, terms and the abbreviation now is for territories and areas conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities. But please, it's not a label. It's really a sort of lingua franca term. And better than that, it is uh, to be describing something that is organic, like the seeds of biocultural diversity around the world, the jewels, the heart of this complex phenomenon that we called diversity in the biological terms, but also in uh, social and cultural terms. So you find ICCAs, as you have uh, uh, briefly seen from the images I have shown, in all the world regions, and you find them spanning all types of ecosystems and cultures. They have uh, thousands of names and they are very diverse, but they all have three characteristics. And what are those? Let's start from the first. In each case, you have a community and you have a territory, a, a natural area, a body of natural resources. And the important thing is that there is a strong bond between the two. Now this bond, if you remember one thing tomorrow and the days after tomorrow about this webinar, please remember this bond. The bond between a community and a territory is what makes an ICCA. It is a bond made of uh, livelihood and uh, survival sometimes. I mean, people draw their food, their water, the, um, the products on which they, they make their homes and their shelters. They have lived their lives on their territories. And there are also uh, places that for them are crucially important for who they are. And it, that means that the bond is also a bond of identity. Sometimes I think about it as, a, as an umbilical cord. It is very strong for that community to possess uh, a relationship with a particular territory to know who they are. Sometimes that bond is not even 
uh, just material, you know, just products. It is a spiritual bond. It's a bond that relates to the past and calls forth the future that the people want. So the strong bond between a community and a territory, which in the, in the Latin languages, the word territory is extremely rich, really is the fundamental characteristic of an ICCAs. But there are two more. And the second one is that the community has a de facto, not necessarily de jure, but a de facto capacity to take decisions about that territory and to get them uh, enforced, to get them respected. In other words, it has a functioning governance institution about that territory. And we'll see it in a moment, uh, more about that. The third characteristic is that the decisions, the practices that the, uh, that community has lead towards the conservation of nature. And as we will see, uh, it is a complex uh, understanding of conservation, is not just you know, setting aside, not at all. It is related to sustainable livelihoods and so on. So again, the three characteristics of ICCAs, a really strong bond between a community and its territory. We are talking about terrestrial, but also marine, fresh water and so on. The community is able to take and enforce decisions and have some rules, for instance, for the utilization of natural resources. And these rules maintain the territory in good condition. And those good conditions are for nature, but also for people. The ICCAs in general, you find them on so-called commons. So, uh, land, water, natural resources that are governed and managed collectively by a community of people. And these, um, these communities develop what some social scientists call institutions. So there are organizations that are taking decisions and uh, they regulate the relationships within the community and with the resources. Sometimes they are very visible. You have big meetings, you have to spend quite a bit of money to organize the meetings. At other times, the things are just embedded into the culture. You don't even talk much about the rules. They become part of who you are, and so they, they don't need to be repeated at all times. It's interesting to know and to understand that the ICCAs are really the oldest examples of uh, successful conservation, collective decision-making about nature. But it is not about conservation outside of livelihood. It is conservation embedded in people's livelihoods, in their culture and identity. As I said before, we are trying to understand conservation uh, in a complex way, which is actually the way in which the World Conservation um, Union, and uh, at that time was called that way, and uh, uh, other major conservation organization in the world in the um, World Conservation Strategy of 1980 understood it. Conservation is a combination of positive activities. Strict preservation is one of those. And in this case, you have a community in uh, uh, Casamance of Senegal, a region of Senegal, that has as a rule that nobody can enter in a particular area of their wetlands um, environments. is absolutely reserved only for the sacred spirits that live there. But you also have, as in this particular image in Italy, conservation as sustainable use, and use that has been repeated year after year, in this particular case, for more than a thousand years, organized and run and ruled by the same institution. But there is also conservation as restoration. Uh, in this case, we are in uh, Ecuador and the community realized that uh, the kind of uh, animals that were brought to graze the land in a particular um, place close to 
Quito actually, uh, were destroying the land and they brought back some um, indigenous species, endogenous species, so that they could restore the particular environment. So a combination of preservation, sustainable use and restoration in the appropriate uh, um, places and uh, uh, situations in a given ecosystem is what uh, conservation means. And this is particularly true for ICCAs. Now, let me give you very quickly a range of examples of ICCAs throughout the world. And I would just give it in a generic sense because otherwise we, will, we could be staying here for, for many hours. So there are sacred spaces and natural features all over the world. You have forested areas, you have mountains, you have thousands of lakes and uh, you have plenty of habitats of sacred animals. These are only some examples of sacred animals whose habitat are conserved by communities in just one country, in this case is India. And then you have uh, sometimes, in fact, sacred spaces may be quite small, but you also have extremely large uh, areas and territories that are conserved because they are the indigenous land and territories um, that are still under control of indigenous peoples, such as in cases like in uh, Colombia, where the indigenous peoples co collectively own their lands, or in Australia, or in Canada. So huge uh, swaths of land. In terms of very large um, ICCAs, you also can um, number the territories and migration routes of nomadic peoples. Here you have an example of the Kashkai people in Iran, but many other examples could be found, for instance, in the Sahel and in other areas in Central Asia. Uh, wetlands, sustainably managed wetlands and fishing grounds and bodies of water are collectively conserved by um, peoples, indigenous peoples and local communities all over the world as they are uh, sustainably managed reserves of resources in forests, in um, wetlands uh, that uh, are bordering um, with other ecosystems, including dry land ecosystems. And particularly sensitive ecological settings, as in this case you have in the top of uh, the hills or in the center of this caldera in Madagascar, are uh, found in many places as having such um, close connection, as we were saying before, with people and are considered special and thereby uh, having rules that lead to their conservation. In uh, so-called developed or, or modern uh, uh, societies, you also have several commons that can be ascribed as uh, ICCAs. So in this, these examples, you have you know, some uh, commons in uh, Europe, uh, in the UK they are called the greens and sometimes they are pretty small but they are very important for the sense of communities of the places. In Spain right now there is an amazing um, rebirth of the interest on the commons. So why are ACCAs important? Because they indeed conserve nature but they also secure livelihoods for uh, millions of people all over the world and they do so in unique ways for unique system and unique uh, context. So today um, there is even a sense of the importance of ICCAs for the global conservation, for their role for the planet. Uh, there are estimates of 25% of terrestrial areas 
being conserved under some form of ICCAs. And this is a coverage that is even larger than the coverage of protected areas, that is approximately 13% on the world. They also embody the capacity of communities to adapt in the face of change, what some scientists call resilience. And why is it so? But it is so because their rules and institutions are tailored to the context. They are built on the collective ecological knowledge and capacity that is built there, that really has sense for that particular locations. And very often, they are the resources that uh, are kept specially for times of stress, such as during uh, you know, climate events and war or famines. Importantly, I think, is uh, uh, that ICCAs are an occasion for empowerment for indigenous peoples and for local communities. And they are an occasion for the youth of this world to have pride in something, to, to really feel that they belong uh, somewhere. So uh, they can secure the rights of indigenous peoples and uh, provide a grounding on their cultural identity. So would you say then that everything is just fine? I mean, we, we're great, there are ICCAs and we can um, be satisfied with those. Well, in fact, let me ask you, don't you think that ICCAs in the world of today are under some kind of threat? And I wish I could see your answer if you are sending it in the, um, in the chat box, but right now I cannot see the answer, so I better go on by providing my own question, I mean my own answer to this question. And it is that unfortunately ICCAs are under some uh, serious threats. The threats are uh, about first and foremost the expropriation of the commons, uh, which are really not the, the way under which you find uh, uh, in, a, in a stable and uh, um, well shared way the property of natural resources in most of the world. They are under threat because of so-called development, uh, tremendous amount of resource extraction all over the world and expansion of infrastructure, land encroachment because of uh, the above, because when you um, uh, come up with very large development initiatives, you uh, trigger some movements of people and these movements of peoples have tremendous consequences for the territories that they get into. And then there are of course violent conflicts and, and wars and throughout the world there, is, there are changes of cultures that uh, may be uh, endogenous but many of them can in, even be uh, put under the, the rubric of acculturation because uh, they are so they are somehow imposed from one dominant culture to another. There is also some form of inappropriate recognition by uh, governments, including uh, by the imposition of protected area status, and of course the climate change that is affecting all of us. So the, these threats can be external and internal to the communities governing the ICCAs. The most serious external threat is when you have a forced eviction and imposition of destructive practices on ICCAs. And often you find that when you have some form of agreement around so-called development, as I was saying a moment ago, uh, between governments and uh, private uh, enterprises, uh, but there are also serious internal threats when there is an erosion of local knowledge and, uh, for instance, the loss of languages and cultural practices. And in fact, when there is a, a, a break in the learning processes within cultures, so the, the communication between the elders and the youth, the ultimate threat the ultimate threat is the loss of the institutions capable of governing the commons, of having decisions together and having those decisions respected. And these are part of the wealth of the world that we do not value at all, uh, or at least we do not value enough. So, however, are there responses to the threats to ICCAs? 
and definitely yes, there are. There are responses by indigenous peoples and local communities themselves. They are organizing, they are coming up with lots of analysis of their situation, self-awareness, and they share that information through a variety of media uh, all over the world. There is diplomatic action that they take, there is legal action, and when nothing really works, there are demonstrations, there, there is even civil disobedience, there is the creation of uh, national, international alliances, and some of those are really specific to ICCAs. In general, what, what do indigenous peoples and local communities want? They, they strengthen themselves and they strengthen their capacities because they want to be recognized as the rightful governing bodies for their ancestral domains and their ICCAs. There are also responses by international policy. This, this has not been falling on the fear um, for, for too long. I mean, up to the last uh, uh, century, I would say yes. It, the, the years were the years were really uh, uh, deaf. But the international uh, policy scene has started responding from the World Parts Congress of Durban in 2003, and from their own the program on protected areas of the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2004 and more and more other decisions and resolutions have started recognizing the value of ICCAs and uh, figuring out ways to support it. So for instance IUCN in 2004 already had identified ICCAs as valuable and defined them as voluntary conserved natural modified ecosystem conserved voluntarily by indigenous peoples and local communities through customary laws and other effective means. And today, um, even the guidance that comes out of IUCN on governance of protected areas recognizes them as one of the four main governance types for uh, protected and today also beyond protected conserved areas. So this um, graphic shows you that ICCAs can be recognized as protected areas, as I said, as one of the for uh, legitimate governance types, but also as conserved areas, because some indigenous peoples and local communities, let's face it, do not want to fit into the systems of protected areas of the states. And uh, the CBD recognizes this because uh, IGE target 11 of the CBD uh, has a phrase that is other effective area-based conservation measures that uh, uh, takes care of areas that are conserved outside of the protected area systems of states. The uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center of uh, UNEP has a special ICCA registry where ICCAs can be registered both as protected and conserved areas. And for that, communities uh, are in charge. They are those who actually upload their data after providing their own free prior and informed consent. And the, the, all over the world, there are now processes to identify peer review and peer support mechanisms to validate the entries in the ICCA registry and in the World Database of Protected Areas. There are also programs such as the ICCA Global Support Initiative uh, with the acronym GSI that are dedicated to uh, ICCAs around the world and they support uh, capacities, uh, they um, promote exchanges, they feed the ICCA registry and they promote the uh, sometimes even the um, granting of small grants and other forms of support to the ICCAs themselves. There are also responses at national level. They're very variable and uh, in some cases there is no response at all and in others some governments have been establishing protected areas to put on top 
of ICCAs to protect them, so really terrible. Uh, but there are also countries that recognize ICCAs and provide them with legal, social, and other types of support. Sometimes this support is appropriate, sometimes it is not appropriate. Uh, an example is Australia. ICCAs in Australia can be recognized as indigenous protected areas and uh, they are uh, having in fact they are you know big it, it this is possible because after uh, the, the the Mabo legal decisions the in aboriginal people in australia have collective ownership over their land and the government can also recognize that their land have values for biodiversity so they support their conservation uh, through various means to a certain flow of benefits. Now, today, above 40% of the Australia protected uh, land is under indigenous protected areas. And this is a beneficial uh, situation for everybody, for conservation of nature, but also for the communities, because uh, all the parameters that are measured within IPAs with respect to non-IPAs are uh, better off. And there is a huge demand to join this program. Another example is Colombia. Well, Colombia has uh, recognized already for some time that indigenous peoples and Afro-Colombian communities have common rights to land and natural resources. So they are the legitimate owners of collectively owned territories, but they cannot, they cannot uh, impede for the governance, government to give concession um, uh, the way to open up their um, territories for underground uh, resources such as oil, mine and uh, uh, minerals. So in a way the um, communities cannot, uh, uh, yes okay, I, I see that there are some other people joining with videos, uh, communities cannot prevent they're uh, coming into the territories. So they are not recognized ICCAs within Colombia on a pair with protected areas as having conservation benefits. So right now uh, there are a couple of decrees that are being discussed in various ways for more meaningful recognition of their conservation benefits of the uh, commonly owned and controlled lands in Colombia. Another example is Senegal. In Senegal, you have a law of decentralization that allows municipality to develop their own conserved areas in their environment. And some people have, uh, some communities have taken advantage of that. Um, so this is one potential way. The community agrees, brings the um, potential conserved areas to the attention of the local municipality. The municipality recognizes this and, uh, and this is somehow um, equivalent to a national recognition. However, the awareness of this pathway for the recognition of ICCAs is very limited and much of this needs to be clarified still. Then I have the examples of the Philippines and uh, we have with us in the webinar Giovanni Reyes who is, who is pictured here by the way, here is Giovanni and uh, he will be speaking about this but uh, in the particular situation of the Philippines we have had the fact that ICCAs have been affirmed as really a crucial strategic posture by the largest coalition of indigenous people in the country, which is Kasapi, and understood as cap capable of putting an extra layer of protection to the collective land rights that the Philippines people have because of their law of ancestral domains. And now they are engaged uh, in the Senate with the, the new ICCA law that is now in the fifth reading and hopefully will be approved very soon. Let me uh, close this uh, uh, presentation by letting you know that uh, while I was uh, discussing the national, national responses to ICCAs, the last three cases, um, Colombia, Senegal and the Philippines, 
where, of course, endogenous um, responses and endogenous uh, processes of recognition in the countries, but with some support from an international consortium that I'm representing here and is actually the organizer of this webinar, which is the ICCA consortium, which is a, a movement uh, that uh, was um, is rooted in the movement that promoted equity in conservation in the last, I would say, 20-30 years. It was actually created in 2008 at the Barcelona World Conservation Congress and established legally in Switzerland in 2010. It is a, a member-based organization with the mission of promoting the appropriate recognition and support to ICCAs. The members are indigenous peoples and local communities, organizations, federations, and there are hun nearly 130 worldwide, but we also have honorary members who are individuals with concerns and capacities for ICCAs, and there are nearly 300 worldwide, and we have a number of uh, very well-supported uh, partners. We worked at the local, national, and regional, and international level. And at the local level, we are mostly supporting grassroots processes of self-strengthening of ICCAs. Some examples here. At the national level, uh, we are supporting a critical mass for effective advocacy in support of ICCAs. So we have ICCAs network in a variety of countries around the world and many more are under development. At the regional level, we promote uh, regional events for capacity building and uh, exchange visits and we have been facilitating many such events throughout the world. And we work at the international level to promote the international recognition of ICCAs for their contribution to conservation of nature and culture. So we organize events, uh, exchanges, we develop all sorts of publication and I'm giving you some examples here sort of quickly, but you can in fact uh, look into our website and the uh, extensive presence in the social media to find out more. I just would like to say that uh, because uh, not everything is uh, easy, uh, we also need to understand that there are people paying a heavy price today for the existence of ICCAs who are still there and we are very concerned with the defenders of the commons of IC and ICCAs who are under personal as well as uh, collective threats. And because of that, we think that it is important to have, as we do, an ICCA alert mechanism, and we are working on a, a solidarity alliance and fund for the defenders of the commons and ICCAs. This is my last slide, and I have some questions for you, uh, while I hope at least you keep those questions in mind. Do you know any ICCA? in your country or elsewhere in the world. What kind of values do they have for you? And are you concerned about some specific threats or changes that are potentially or actually negative to impact upon them? And if you do, um, or would you wish to do something about that, uh, what could it be? I mean, how do you think that we could secure such ICCAs that are of value for you? So with this, I would like to thank you very much. And I know this was a bit uh, long, but there is much to say about ICCAs. Thank you very much, Grazia. Um, so right now as a good transition, actually we'll continue on the Philippines. And I would like to invite Giovanni Reyes to take the word. Uh, so Giovanni Reyes is a Sagada Bon Kanahe Igorot, I hope I pronounced it well, from the mountain province in the Cordillera region of northern Luzon in the Philippines. He is also a NICC Consortium Council member and he, is, he has the special responsibility for ICCAs of indigenous peoples. 
Um, since 2009, uh, he's Secretary General of the National Coalition of the Indigenous People in the Philippines, PESAP. And he also convened the founding congress of the Philippine ICC Consortium that is called Bukluran, uh, on which I hope you will tell us a bit more about. Can you see the um, uh, map of the Philippines? And uh, uh, this is the remaining forest cover, uh, which is about uh, 6 million uh, uh, hectares. And uh, the orange one there, as you see, is the uh, key biodiversity areas. And then the other one is, the third one is the parks and protected area estate. And the last would be the ancestral domains. Uh, the ancestral domains of indigenous peoples in the Philippines cover nearly about one fourth of the total land area of the uh, uh, country. We have at present uh, 10 ICCA sites, um, which is a continuation of what we have started in 2012, uh, when we launched the first ICCA conference in the Philippines. Uh, you find here Mount Taungay, and in the eastern side of Northern Luzon, Bayanihan. Can you hear? Hello. Yes, we hear you well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then, uh, then there is uh, uh, Mount. Uh, this this should be Tino, no, not not Mount Pulis. And then you have Imugan. So in the mainland of Northern Luzon, we have four. I mean five. Uh, there should be five in mainland uh, uh, Northern Luzon. And then we have one in Sote, that's in Mindanao. And then the other one is located in uh, the island clusters, the island group uh, uh, of Bawan. And then the uh, four in Mindanao. So we have a total of, uh, a total of uh, 10 uh, ICCA sites now uh, ongoing in the Philippines. Uh, they are found in strategic geographical locations in the country, in the archipelago. And uh, it's all about empowerment of indigenous peoples. Uh, and it aims to achieve and strengthen uh, the uh, greater sense of uh, belongingness uh, between community and uh, their territory. And uh, as we all know that it's now ongoing in the Philippines uh, resonates in programs uh, being talked about uh, in the international arena, for example, in the UNCBD. Okay, so it seems that we cannot hear him anymore. Maybe, Greta, you want to explain a bit more about the situation in the Philippines, because right now we stayed a bit like with the wish to know more, but uh, actually we... Yeah, I mean, one thing I would like to tell you is that what Giovanni was is uh, showing is uh, sites of uh, an important national initiative that is recognizing uh, ICCAs as essential for biodiversity conservation in the Philippines. So these um, these ten sites that is showing are not only crucial and uh, fundamental for the indigenous peoples of the Philippines who identify them, who select them, and actually who are now uh, demonstrating and detailing their biodiversity and cultural diversity. They are also identified as essential from the perspective of uh, the national government and in particular the environmental authorities. So this is a major initiative that uh, uh, shows once again how the Philippines is uh, at the forefront of uh, the recognition of ICCAs throughout the world. As I think I told you before, uh, the, uh, there is now in the fifth reading in the Senate, a specific legislation on ICCAs and that specific legislation is about the fact that if 
a community declares its own ICCAs, this is not only uh, under their collective rights and collective control, as uh, uh, it was already under the ancestral domain law, but it is the, it is their own prerogative to say no to underground exploration of uh, oil and gas and mining and exploitation of uh, the above, which uh, has been the fundamental point of conflict and contention uh, between indigenous peoples and local communities and their government in the Philippines for a long time. So I see that Emma has put forth the um, website of the consortium, the, the, the key page on the website. Emma, would you like to describe it a little? Yeah, just briefly before we go to the questions, I would like to show you a bit this platform that we constructed trying to uh, we constructed it with the idea that we really wanted to have a platform for ICCAs, for the ICCA movement. And so we decided to split our website in two parts. One side on ICCAs, let's say the green one, and one side on the organization, the, the movement, the ICCA Consortium. On the side of the ICCA, you can go to the menu here and there is a lot of resources. So this code is to know more about what ICCAs are, exactly what followed finally today in the end today one is about um read and watch so it's a lot of written resource and you can find a lot of information on self-identified icca iccas grassroots discussions there are several uh, iccas that are um in of which you can see videos and there are a lot of uh, different examples as you can see uh, here just to continue we also um, try to give some ideas about how to take action but of course it's not at all exhaustive and i invite you to, to check this uh, a bit later if you wish and just to continue uh, on this website so here you have more information on the organization as i said but i won't go through it right now so i would like to take more time for the questions but if you scroll down then you can see uh, our news and action the different uh, meetings that we are doing and um, and uh, well the different events and news uh, you can stay up to date with our newsletter and here which is the part that i personally uh, like a lot you can read on emblematic icca so this one is uh, on uh, Ethiopia and you can learn more. Uh, click on learn more to go to the detail on what is this ICCA in particular. Have uh, some uh, elements of uh, to understand it better. And there is also, for example, this one, which is the fourth one, is on Coron Island, which is in the Philippines. And each one of them are a bit uh, detailed here. So we invite you to, to visit it if you wish. And to know a little bit more about ICCAs and the ICCA Consortium, please visit our website or simply write to us. All the informations and links are in the description of the video here below. Thank you very much.